Uh, hi, my name is Mark McGinn. I'm the, uh, I was a uh, fire chief in Albany from December of 1992 and retired uh, April of 2011. Fire prevention has always been my passion. Uh, in 1993, we started a number of uh, city ordinances, sprinkler ordinance and also a fire alarm ordinance. Um, I, I knew when I first took over in 1993 that the best line of defense for our city, because we're a highly uh, uh, impacted city with, with uh, high density, that uh, fire prevention was gonna be the only way that I was gonna properly give uh, uh, life, uh, um, life safety to, uh, the proper life safety to the citizens of Albany. Um, in 1995, our uh, crews went door to door and we were informing the public the importance of installing smoke alarms. From 1995 to about uh, 2005, we installed over 2,000 smoke alarms to the residents of Albany. And I thought, like everybody else, that we were doing, doing the proper thing. And uh, in 2006, I was given a, a video to watch and it showed a side-by-side -side test with an ionization and a photoelectric smoke alarm. I knew that there were two smoke alarms, but I didn't know that there was really much difference between the two. I thought that they both were operational, like everything else, they just gave you a different choice. And in this film, <coughs> they started this smoldering fire, and I'm, I'm watching this smoldering fire, and within two minutes, the photoelectric smoke alarm activated. And I thought, okay. And then I'm watching, and after a number of minutes pass by, I, I see the smoke banking down from the ceilings, and the smoke alarms, both smoke alarms disappear. Uh, ionization had not activated. Uh, I'm seeing the smoke now from, from the living room uh, start to go up the stairwells. And I'm thinking, wow, if there's anybody upstairs, uh, they're gonna be trapped because there's no way in the world they're gonna be able to come, come down. After maybe, I'd say, uh, uh, eight minutes had elapsed, I, the, the floor was almost banked down to the ceiling, and uh, to my horror, the alarm did not, the, the ionization smoke alarm did not activate until it went into a flame, until there was a flame on the couch. And I thought to myself, that's nothing more than a flame detector. Uh, I immediately went next door to where my uh, fire marshal was and I, and I told him, I said, you have to come in here and watch this. So I started the uh, video from the beginning and we watched it and he was, he was just flabbergasted and, he, and he, he turned to me and he said, uh, what are you going to do? And uh, I said, I, I don't know. And um, I was very distressed. I mean, you can imagine over a 10-year period that we've installed all these smoke alarms. We've, made, we've had an active door-to-door -door campaign in, informing people the importance of installing smoke alarms. And now I'm, I'm, I'm finding that uh, the smoke alarms that we installed were the ionization type that, were, were, again, were nothing more than a flame detector. So uh, I did nothing for, for six months. I actually went into denial. And uh, my fire marshal would prompt me about every couple months, he'd come in my office and say, have you made a decision? And uh, after I settled down for, for a while, um, I started doing some research. And as this research was unfolding, I was finding out that there was uh, uh, a great inherent problem with the ionization uh, smoke alarm. And in 2008, I finally drew a line in the sand and just made a, an executive decision that our city was gonna be a photoelectric only from my standpoint. It was not gonna be from an ordinance standpoint, but just from our fire prevention bureau, that's, that's what was gonna take place. So from that point on, all our plans that were reviewed, we had stamped on there photoelectric only. Uh, and that's the only smoke alarm at, the, at that time that we were pushing. In 2010, uh, I was really starting to really get active with it because I was starting to become very angry uh, seeing that uh, there was just no uh, knowledge in the fire industry at all between the two from the fire chiefs, uh, even in the fire prevention section where you would expect them to have uh, an extensive knowledge. And so I was asking the fire prevention officers of Alameda County where our city resides. It's an area of about 1.5 million people that um, we should really push the uh, photoelectric smoke alarms. And they were very tacit about it. They just didn't seem to be uh, uh, much interest. 
So I started my own little campaign and trying to push it and was met with just uh, uh, not, I wouldn't say res resistance, but just uh, uh, of uh, a, a position that they didn't really care. They had a smoke alarm and they were fine with that. It didn't matter which one you used. So uh, in May of 2010, I wrote to the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association in America, and I uh, made a statement that we need to step, step out and declare the ionization smoke alarm. We, we cannot call it a smoke alarm anymore. It must be classified nothing more than a flame detector. And the only smoke alarm, true smoke alarm, uh, that's gonna uh, detect visible smoke would be the photoelectric. That was printed in their uh, May 2010 issue. And when it was printed in the May 2010 issue, uh, I immediately received a phone call from Adrian Butler from the World Fire Safety Foundation. And he was congratulating me for my position. And um, I thought it was a little strange. I was being contacted by, a, by an individual from Australia. But after talk to, talking to Adrian Butler, I soon found out that this individual uh, was a, an expert in the field. And I started talking to him more and more. And within, I'd say, about a month, he was encouraging me to become the first city in the United States to mandate uh, photoelectric only smoke alarms, which we did. Uh, we went forward uh, to the council. Uh, I, I drafted a staff report and uh, drafted an ordinance and made a presentation to the council on, on July uh, 2nd of 2010, which went by with no problems whatsoever. Uh, because it's a, a new ordinance, that you have to have two uh, public meetings. So the first one, of course, was, was what we call a slam dunk. Uh, council voted unanimously 5-0. <clears throat> the second meeting was July 19th. And by then, I was just amazed with the opposition and the letters and phone calls that started pouring into City Hall. We were getting opposition from the, the world's largest manufacturer, trying to intimidate our council. Uh, UL Underwriters Laboratory uh, uh, sent letters. Um, also, I individuals that worked for this large manufacturer, Hughes and Associates, uh, National Fire Protection Association, and a number of other agencies that were supported by uh, the alarm industry, were, they were trying to intimidate uh, our council. And uh, I, I was really beginning to feel an uneasiness that our council was gonna cave in uh, for all, from all the opposition that was pouring in. So I contacted Adrian Butler, and uh, since I, we talked on the phone almost daily, I knew that there were two fathers from Ohio that lost their daughters in off-campus house fires. Uh, Dean Dennis lost his daughter in 2003 when four hardwired ionization smoke detectors uh, did not sound and a, I think it was five uh, college students died. Two years, two years later, almost to the day, in 2005, Doug Turnbull lost his daughter when 17, and let me, let me say that again, 17 hardwired ionization detectors did not sound, and three college students died. And the more and more the information that I was getting, it, it was just, uh, it was very apparent that uh, in, in my city, I was adamant that I wanted these ionization detectors uh, banned. And um, even though that, that wasn't the case, we uh, didn't ban them, but we mandated. So what happened was in our council meeting uh, on July 19th, uh, Underwriters Laboratory was present, and also uh, the world's largest manufacturer was present. And I knew they were going to be there, and I had, I, I presented a film called UL Exposed, and it was uh, uh, through the World Fire Safety Foundation that I was able to view this during the council. After my short presentation, uh, the largest manufacturer got up there and was basically uh, 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 debasing uh, everything that I presented and really was trying to dissuade our council that they were, they were making the wrong decision. Uh, 